Morning, everyone. How y'all doing today? So I'm getting a lot of questions about this, so I'll just tell you all at the same time. Um, I broke it, uh, and not to over-spiritualize it or anything, but um, Renovate's calling is to facilitate spiritual, physical, mental, emotional, relational, and financial health. And as part of that, you may or may not know, but we have a martial arts dojo here, and uh, it's intended to help with at least the physical and sometimes with the, the emotional and mental. It, it really does uh, help with that too. But uh, I was sparring last Monday and, and just ended up breaking the, the bone under my thumb. So uh, I would ask you to pray for me. I see the orthopedic surgeon tomorrow. If I don't need surgery, they'll probably just cast it. Cast it. If I need surgery to put a screw or whatever in there they do, um, then, yeah. So just pray I don't need surgery, okay? Appreciate that. Um, he, he's fine. He, he, he's fine. He got the best of this one. Uh, this is, you know, I, pre I teach and I, I preach, you know, proper pu punching technique. Um, I must not have had proper punching technique or this wouldn't have happened. So I, I have no one to blame but myself. But I am discovering why we have opposable thumbs. <laughs> have you ever tried to tie your shoe with one thumb? It takes a little creativity. I'm also discovering I can't play guitar. Uh, I can't work out uh, my normal workout routine. I can't do, um, and probably worst is I'm supposed to test for my third degree black belt tomorrow night. So, not sure how I'm going to pull that off, but I'm going to try. So, but uh, if you're thinking of joining uh, our RMA, uh, Renovate Martial Arts, our martial arts program, uh, don't let this deter you or scare you away. Um, actually, you don't even have to spar in the early, uh, we encourage you to spar from yellow belt on, but you don't really have to until uh, the later ranks. It is required if you want, a, if you want an advanced belt, uh, obviously because, you know, if you're learning how to fight and you never practice fight, fighting, it just, it doesn't make no sense. It's like being a Christian and never doing the things that Jesus told us to do, so... Knowledge only helps if you use it, right? Anyway, we're continuing our Believe Message series this morning. Today is Halloween, as you all know. And uh, I understand that many Christians do not observe Halloween because it's connected with evil things like witchcraft and uh, even Satanism. But that's actually a relatively new thing. The Church of Satan was founded in 1966, um, and they quickly hijacked this holiday. It's, it's, one, of their, uh, it's one of their most important days. Um, but, you know, Halloween, actually, the thing it's related to most closely is, a, is an ancient Christian holiday called All Hallows' Eve. But there's a lot more to it, and it doesn't really matter. Um, my point is, is that just about everybody's thinking about it today. Um, and because of that, I want to call my message The Real Walking Dead. And we are going to be looking at the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11, if you guys want to turn there. Father, as we tune into this uh, Bible story, this true historical Bible story, um, we pray that you would help us to learn something important in our walk with you, uh, Holy Spirit. The only way that we ever get anything from you, from your word, is if you come into our hearts and draw us to the truth. So we invite you, Holy Spirit, draw us to the truth. Just whisper that to the Lord right now if that's your prayer. Open truth to us today, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I don't know if you remember this far back, this has been a long series, but when we began it, I said that we, we wouldn't make our way all the way through the book of John. Um, and so I knew that we would be running up against the holidays, like in fact we are, 
Um, and I, I really want to do messages that are appropriate for the holidays. Um, so today is actually the last message of our John message series, at least for now. Uh, we may come back to it later. But the timing of this could not have been better. Uh, we're in chapter 5 today. Many experts actually divide the book of John into two parts, verse, uh, chapters 1 through 11 and then 12 through 21. <clears throat> What we're looking at this week, the story of Lazarus, chapter 11, um, is actually, it's the, it's the pinnacle, it's the climax of the public ministry of Jesus. So chapters 12 through 21 actually almost exclusively focus on the, the last week of Jesus' life, what we call Holy Week. And so it would be probably a good time to come back to this when we get close to Easter and we may do that, but this morning, let's take a look at the, I'm going to read the whole story of Lazarus, um, so this is a long section. I encourage you, stay with me, okay? Let's go. John 11, starting with verse 1. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Mary and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said a short while ago, the Jews there tried to stone you, and yet you are going back. Remember that last week in chapter 10? He slipped away. They tried to stone him. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in daylight will not stumble for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she said this, he, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had, who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. 
Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the blind, the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more, deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, did not I tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of those people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. So I thought it was pretty cool that our series brought us to the story of Lazarus today of all days, right? It's basically the story of a mummy coming out of a tomb. So it's perfect for a holiday that kind of focuses on the macabre. But, you know, whether you like it or not, Halloween is a big deal in our country. Some people are really into it, like these people. I think they spent more on their yard than they did on their house. You know, I, I've actually met people that, that treat the, the myths of Halloween and the monsters and stuff like that like they're more real than Jesus is. And I think that's because they're so visible. You know what I mean? The stuff of the kingdom isn't always visible, but these things are in our face all the time. Halloween is when <clears throat> all the horror movies come out in the theaters. It's when, you know, it, all the TV shows, they're, they're constantly playing the horror movies and stuff. <clears throat> but really, this is year-round, if you think about it. In fact, our culture is obsessed with things like zombies. You notice that? I did a little bit of research and I discovered that there are 841 large budget feature films about zombies. 841. And I bet there are thousand, thousands more if you include the low budget ones. And that's not even to mention the, the video games and the comics and books and, and music and TV shows and stuff like that. <clears throat> but... Uh, Nowadays, the focus of Hall Halloween, it wasn't always this way, but it's, the focus is on kind of death and evil. So on a day, we're going to create a, a juxtaposition today. On a day where the world kind of focuses on the walking dead, we're going to focus on Lazarus, one of the real walking dead, in a positive way. And I want to challenge uh, kind of our belief systems, and I don't just mean about Halloween, but... I just want to challenge what we believe every day about death and life and stuff like that. My first point today is believe, then you will see. Believe, then you will see. So I said that the, you know, a lot of people believe in, in these myths and monsters more than they believe in Jesus. And I don't mean that they, that they actually believe in monsters, although I have to tell you, I have met people that really believe in vampires. It's true. And I actually saw a, a TV show about a whole society uh, of people that believe in vampires. So I think that's just because that's what people, uh, that's what's in their face all the time. That's, that's what they see, right? But that's not a good reason to believe in things, especially in our culture. We shouldn't believe just because we see. In fact, a lot of what's in front of us all the time isn't real. We're saturated with things all the time that aren't real. Social media, fantasy novels, TV shows, movies. <clears throat> the vast majority of that stuff isn't real. It's not grounded in reality. Now, I'm not opposed to fantasy per se. It's just if you're not grounded in reality, those things can really mess you up. Like you end up believing in real vampires or something, you know? So seeing 
should not automatically result in believing. Do you hear that? Seeing should not automatically result in believing because there are many, many things that we see that aren't real. And there are many things that are real that we can't see. For example, nuclear radiation. We can't, well, gravity, that's a good one. But we can't see nuclear radiation. Um, and uh, where were we? Believe, then you will see. You can't see nuclear radiation. Uh, you can't see electromagnetic flux. But both of those things, we're surrounded by them all the time. In fact, the sun is a giant nuclear reactor. Did you know that? And all of our wireless devices, um, they send and receive uh, that information through electromagnetic flux. And there's many, many, many more things that we can't see but we know exists. And the biggest and most powerful one of those is the kingdom of God. We can't directly see it, but we can see the effects of it all the time. You know, when... When someone is healed miraculously, uh, when somebody's life who is totally messed up, they surrender their life to Jesus, all of a sudden, you know, they're like healthy, functioning people again. That's, that's the expression of the kingdom of God. We see the effects of the kingdom. It's just like the sun. You know, we can't see the radiation, but we can certainly see the sun, right? And actually, by the sun, we can see everything else. <clears throat> but what our text tells us is that many times we actually have to believe before we see. We see that in the story that we're looking at today. Jesus actually told the disciples in what I just read. He said, you know, Lazarus is dead. He's already dead. So if, if the disciples didn't believe that Jesus could raise him from the dead, because he said, he's, he's not, that's not the end of the story. He's not going to stay dead. If they didn't believe that Jesus could do that, most likely they wouldn't have gone with him and they wouldn't have seen the miracle. So sometimes you have to believe and then you'll see. But we freaking hate that, don't we? We hate that. Think about it. When somebody calls you up and they go, hey, I really need to talk to you. Can we get together? What's the first thing you want to know? What do you want to talk about? Right? You know, some of us are brave and we'll just jump into the meeting, but we don't like being sideswiped by things. We want to know. We hate the unknown. We hate those kind of mysteries. That's actually my second point this morning. Believe despite the unknown. Believe despite the unknown. When Jesus found out that Lazarus was sick, he actually stayed where he was for two days. He didn't go right away. And that really messed with Mary and Martha. In fact, both of them, separate from each other, said, <clears throat> Lord, if you would have come, my brother wouldn't have died. Can you imagine how they must have felt? You said you love us. Why didn't you come? Why didn't you save them? <clears throat> you stayed for two days? What the heck, Jesus? Do you ever feel like that to God? You know, do you ever wonder, Lord, why did you let this bad thing happen? Come on, anybody? You guys have had really good lives. <laughs> See, we want to believe in those circumstances that God is good. But we wonder, why did you let that happen, God? Why? That's the unknown. The question why is we want to know. It's unknown. We hate the unknown. We hate those kind of mysteries. Mary and Martha wanted to know, why did you wait so long? <clears throat> but here's the thing. 
despite the unknown, there's evidence, clear evidence, that both Mary and Martha trusted Jesus despite the unknown. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been there, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So there's the confusion. There's the why. But she also said, but I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. There's the trust. There's the trust. So Martha trusted Jesus. Actually, Mary did too, although she expressed it in a different way. <clears throat> so our text tells us that this is the same Mary that poured out that really expensive perfume on Jesus and wiped, her, wiped his feet with her hair. Remember that story? But did you know this is also the same Martha and Mary uh, from Luke chapter 10 where, where Jesus went to visit them and uh, Martha was really busy making dinner or whatever she was doing and she was mad at Mary because Mary just sat there at the feet of Jesus soaking in his, every word that he was speaking to her, right? So in both of those stories about Mary, where was she? She was at the feet of Jesus, right? Both times. So where do you think we're going to find her in this scenario? At the feet of Jesus. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. So both women expressed that frustration, that confusion about why Jesus waited so long. That unknown, why did you wait so long? But they also expressed trust. Martha did it with her words. Lord, I believe that you can turn this around. She did it with her words. Mary did it with her worship. She was at the feet of Jesus. So they both showed that they believed despite the unknown. And you know why they believed? Despite the confusion, despite the things not turning out the way they wanted, they believed because they knew that Jesus loved them. That's my next point. Believe Jesus loves you deeply. Listen, when, when he doesn't act the way you want him to, which he seldom does, when, he, when, he, when the results aren't what you think they should be, what you expect in your timing, you can still trust. You can still trust. Why? Because he loves you deeply. There's a real cool dynamic in this story taking place. Jesus mourned because they were mourning. Even though he sees that the end of this thing is going to be good. He still mourns when we mourn. See, we see the evidence of that deep kind of love all through this story. First of all, remember when, when, when the, the message came from the sisters? What was that message? It says, the one you love is sick. See, they knew that Jesus loved Lazarus. In fact, it says that he loved all three of them. So they appealed to that love. And Jesus responded, right? He came. But he didn't do it like they expected. He didn't do it the way they would have wanted him to do it. Certainly didn't do it in their timing. <clears throat> Excuse me. Did not do it in their timing. <clears throat> But he came. He showed up. And he showed up despite the fact, knowing that going there was putting himself at significant jeopardy because he knew that the Jews wanted to kill him and they were serious this time. In fact, he knew that in only a week they would successfully execute him. He knew that. He went anyway. Then it says that 
he saw uh, that Mary and the other people were weeping and he was deeply moved and troubled. He was grieving even though he knew Lazarus was about to be risen, right? He knew he was about to resurrect Lazarus, but he still grieved with the people uh, that were grieving. And he grieves with you when you grieve. <clears throat> Even though he knows everything's going to be okay ultimately. He knows that. So it's okay to grieve. He grieves with us. But underlying, we should know what he knows. It's going to be okay. In fact, it's going to be more than okay. Then on the way to the tomb, it says, Jesus wept. That's one of the shortest verses in the Bible, depending on which translation you look at and actually which language you look at it in. Um, but it's one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Then the Jews said, see how he loved them. They, they could see his love through his tears. He mourned with those who mourn. But it isn't just Lazarus he loves deeply. He loves us that way. Believe that. God so loved the world. Believe that Jesus loves you deeply. So I'm going to wrap up today's message, and I'm really wrapping up the whole series with this thought. Believe. I don't mean just give mental assent to his existence. I mean believe. Believe beyond the visible world. In fact, you should doubt much of what you see and hear. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, we fix our eyes, listen to this, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So believe in the bigger reality of God's kingdom. Even the parts you can't see yet. And believe despite the unknown mysteries of why God does what he does, why he allows what he allows, why he doesn't do what you think he should do. Believe him despite that unknown mystery. <clears throat> because listen, logically, if God exists, he has to be good. If he doesn't exist, there isn't any such thing as good or evil. So there's nothing to be upset about. I, I'm always confused by why atheists are so mad at a God that they don't believe in. <laughs> what the heck? But see, I would present to you that we all know good and evil is real, right? We all know that. I don't care how much you say you don't. I could prove it in about 14 seconds. I could do something bad to you and you would go, why did you do that? Well, why shouldn't I? Because it's bad. Oh, really? So you do believe in good and evil. And because of that, we all know God exists. I don't care how much you scream, he doesn't. And we all know that he's good, right? We all know that he's good. Because of that, you can trust that he loves you deeply because that's what goodness does. He loves us deeply. You know, the story of Lazarus should remind all of us that death isn't the, the end. It's not the end. In fact, if we uh, look at this through a kingdom perspective, all of us are the real living dead, or at least we will be. We're all the real living dead. That's a kingdom perspective. 
We're all going to be risen again. We're all eternal beings that will never die. There is no death. Jesus said in this passage, we will never die. There is no death. Of course, our bodies will die, but be glad to get rid of this whole thing. Not right now, though, Lord. <laughs> Maybe later. <clears throat> We're all eternal beings. We're all going to live somewhere forever. So listen, as a believer, you should not fear death. You should not fear monsters. You should not fear anything except the one who can put your soul in hell. Sorry, that's the words of Jesus. Think about it. People always, often, I should say, often ask the question, you know, what's the worst that can happen in some situation? And the pinnacle of that is typically thought of as death right? The worst that can happen is death. That's not the worst thing that can happen. Believe me. The worst thing that can happen is to spend eternity without God. <clears throat> so if you believe, you don't need to fear death. And we shouldn't fear, we shouldn't grieve the way that the world grieves when someone dies. It's okay to grieve. We should grieve. We should grieve when bad things happen, but we shouldn't grieve like the world grieves with who have no hope. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. If you believe, you have hope. If you don't have hope, if you're obsessed with the thought of dying or people you love dying, then you, that is an indicator that you need to repent. That word just means change your mind. You need to change the way you think about death and life and eternity. You need to have a kingdom perspective. You need to believe before you see the kingdom reality. Right? When, when Martha expressed how confused she was about what happened with her brother... What did Jesus do? He just reminded her of kingdom reality. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. And then he asked her a critical question, the most important question. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? And her answer was perfect. Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. <laughs> That's the theme of this message series. That's the purpose of this message of our whole series, that we would believe in Jesus as he really is. Not as we think about him, not as, you know, as he really is, the Messiah, the Son of God. Not just a good moral teacher, not just a really nice guy. He's God. It's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. It's not a scary Halloween story. It's the reality of the kingdom. This is also, this, what she says here is the purpose of the whole reason that John wrote this book. It's summarized towards the end of the book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for this wonderful series. Thank you for the book of John. It's been so fun, so encouraging, so life-giving. Father, I just pray that this, the, the ideas in this book would not be white noise in our life. 
that these thoughts wouldn't be like a refrigerator magnet that's always there, but we don't even see it anymore. Help us, God, to comprehend the challenge, the invitation to believe. In fact, right now I want to give you the opportunity in this room, you people at home that are watching online, whether you're watching live, whether you're going to watch this later, I can say with absolute confidence that the Holy Spirit is drawing you and saying, believe. And I feel like summing this series up, I'd be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to actually do that, to actually say yes to the Lord. If you don't have a confidence of where you're going, if you, you, you are going to live forever somewhere, you're going to live forever in heaven or you're going to live forever in hell. And you can't wait to the, to the judgment day to decide what's happening with that. Choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to say yes to Jesus, if you want to declare that you believe, just repeat this prayer after me. Jesus, how about we all just repeat this out loud, unless you don't believe, unless you don't want to, but even if you already believe, already are following him, let's just repeat this together. Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And I believe in my confession that you will give me life, eternal life. Forgive me as I forgive others. I choose to forgive others. And save me, God. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, Father, I just pray for everybody that prayed that prayer right now, that you would surround them with good, godly people, a good church community, if not here, anywhere, just somewhere that it's good church community. I ask, Father, that they would become disciples, not in their mind only, but that, that, that as you renew their minds, that would pour out into their life and it would affect other people. It would affect their behaviors. We need your mercy, God. Come, Lord, in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Amen.